Hello everyone, it's me again, and today we'll be finally finishing up our videos on PCR, basically. So this is the part two of the basic PCR review um, video, and I'm sorry for the for the delay. This video should have been up a few days ago, but re recently I've been pretty busy, and I just haven't found the time or energy to do this. So I figure I'd just finish this up tonight before the beginning of a new week. And maybe next week I can finally begin my series of videos on cloning. So let's right get down to it then. Okay, I'll be using this website uh, for a good part of this video, and I'm gonna pu put this link in the descriptions of my in the description of the video, so you can check this out yourself. Okay, so today we're, what we're gonna talk about are it's kind of some troubleshooting and guides general tips about PCR and also some of the details that I didn't mention in my first video. For, for example, let's think about the PCR. We want to amplify our specific gene of interest, right? Or, you know, whatever, our target of interest, our fragment. But the thing is, is that the only piece that we're amplifying? So let's not, even, let's, let's not think about dimer-dimer uh, formation or, you know, or primers being, you know, prime against each other or non-specific binding. So that's all kind of random-ish. That's not calculated at all. Um, what I'm saying is that are there other fragments that are going to be made at a consistent level every time you run a PCR reaction, no matter what? And the answer is, well, yes, there will be. And uh, you might be wondering what they are. Well, let's look at this figure, for example. We have the two double-stranded DNA template, right? So shown by these two black lines. You denature it, obviously, during the first step of the cycle, and then you have two single, two single strands. And then you have your uh, reverse and four primers, priming from the uh, five prime to three prime direction. And what you, what you have noticed is that once it starts priming, right, so it binds to a specific region, then how does it know when to stop you know, when it keeps going. Does it know? Well, no, it doesn't know. So, let's say these two red vertical lines is where your target, where your gene of interest is. However, your primers, your polymerase is going to keep amplifying, keep adding nucleotides, no matter what. I mean, eventually it's going to stop, but before then, you're not going to have a nice fragment you know, that the, the ample kind of you desire, the length is not going to be correct. They have this kind of hybrid uh, DNA. So that's kind of troubling, right? But no, hold on for a second. So that's the first round of, of PCR amplification. You get this product. During the second round is where everything comes together. So the second round, then, you know, it denatures again. So then you have these four fragments, right? You have the original two templates, and then you have this kind of a hybrid DNA f cr template created from the first round of PCR. Uh, excuse me. Um, so what happens is that your PCR primers come, comes in again, anneals to your original templates, but also as well as your newly synthesized templates from your previous round of PCR. And they'll start extending again. And this is where it becomes specific. So your PCR, you know, based on your original template, again, it's going to create these two hybrid strands. But the PCR primers that anneal to your synthesized templates are going to stop this time because there's no more uh, nucleotides at either direction. I mean, sorry, no more template at either direction. So it's going to stop there, and that is how you get specific amplicon amplification. And after the second round, you'll have these PCR products. You'll have the original two uh, template from your uh, from your source, your DNA. And then you have, you know, the hybrid DNA templates kind of from your first round of ampli amplifi amplification. And then your um, smaller templates that prime to your hybrid DNA that is cut short and exactly the length that you want. So this is your amplicon um, template. And what's interesting is that after this, as you, is, as you can imagine, all these strands are going to be denatured again. And then you'll create more and more of these short strands, right? Because, you know, all, every single of these strands, all these strands are going to be templates again. 
and then your primers will kneel and they'll just you know keep going to you know from five prime to three prime direction until they reach the end and that's how you generate more and more of a desired amplicon and they have this nice chart here to show you kind of exactly how many of each products you're getting well let's see if this makes sense so here we have pcr cycle right from zero to n Law on both ends is basically referring to your original template, and it's always going to be two, no matter what, right? Because you're just, you only have that you know DNA sample, and you're not adding you know different templates and such. It's always going to be original two. It's always going to be you know the two single strands of DNA. Law on both ends, short on the other, is the uh, hybrid DNA that that is produced once you use the original template. And uh, once your primers bind to the original template, and that's going to be increased by 2n, where n is the m number of cycles, right? Because after each cycle, you're going to create two more because this stays consistent. It's always two. So after each round, you're creating two more, two more, two more. That's why it's 2n. Short on both ends is the uh, fragment that you want to use as a template. It's the kind of the, the perfect template against of your amplicon. And that's only generated after the second round of PCR. You get two of them, right? So if you go back a little bit, you see here, so you have the two of them, so this one here and this one there. And then, you know, as you, as you, you know, increase the amount of cycles, you increase it exponentially because, you know, you're creating templates at the same time and then you're priming to them. So it's not like long on both ends that you are, you know, it's always the same. But, you know, sure, on both ends, you're using, you know, templates from here and also f from here that you're creating. That's why it's a exponential function. The total strands is just, you know, all your strands, you know, your, your, um, you know, your 5 prime to 3 prime, 3 prime, and 3 prime to 5 prime strands. This kind of, you can just add it all the way across. And then your total amplification is just your total DNA, uh, you know, double stranded wide. So it's just basically half of your total strands, or 2 to the N, basically. And uh, that's pretty much it for the uh, PCR um, products overview. If you have any questions, just let me know. But, you know, working with Scholar's website, read through this, um, is, I think it's uh, very helpful uh, as a review. So the next thing I'm going to talk about, which I kind of briefly went over is uh, last time, is uh, tag polymerase uh, versus uh, PFU uh, polymerase. So what's the difference and when to use, um, uh, you know, what situation to use the other one? Well, um, let me back, a little, back up a little bit. At the beginning of PCR, the first polymerase they used was actually isolated from Escherichia coli or E. coli. And um, what happened is that because E. coli obviously doesn't grow at super high temperatures, this polymerase became deactivated every single time there was a cycle, right? So the first uh, first uh, type of polymerase um, that was used was derived from E. coli, and this just completely degraded after every single round uh, of amplification because of the high temperature. So they had to add fresh polymerase after every cycle, and that was just, you know, extremely annoying. So the kind of the standard uh, PCR polymerase people used now it's the polymerase um, from uh, what was the organism? Polymerase from yeah, that's right, from uh, thermus aqua aquatic aquatic aqua aquaticus. Sorry, I can't talk today. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm getting tongue tied and everything. Yeah, it's from uh, thermus aqua. Let's spell this aquaticus aquaticus I guess aquaticus okay whatever so it's from this organism and it's a, a thermophilic bacterium and thus its polymerase, polymerase is able to withstand the um, high temperature but the thing is for this polymerase so this is kind of the conventional polymerase right and this is called tag polymerase this is derived from the organism organism's name right T A Q right tag so Tag polymerase is nice because it's you know it can withstand high temperature, but it's also it's, it's more error prone because you know there's no um, three prime to uh, five prime exonuclease you know proofreading activity. So in case if they mispaired something, it's going to go back and fix that. It's, that's not going to happen. 
but uh, this works rather well though. So a lot of people, you know, will you know usually still use uh, tag polymerase. And the other thing is that tag polymerase, because it doesn't have proofreading, they'll add a uh, adenine uh, base at the end of each uh, at at the end of um, the three prime region at both ends of the DNA. And that's actually that's actually pretty useful if you're going to do TA cloning later on because you know TA cloning is based on you know the the A and T interaction so because it has oh, has an overhang of A TA cloning takes advantage of that and has an overhang of T in the vector itself so that's useful for cloning to the TA vectors and the third type of polymerase people are using is uh, <clears throat> it's called a uh, PFU right and that's Again, from a bacteria, hypothermophilic bacteria, called uh, pyro, pyrococcus, few, for, for, what was it called again? Pyrococcus ferriosus, something like that. Ferriosus, I think is, that's how you spell it. Yeah, pyrococcus ferriosus. I uh, hate these bacteria names, I never pronounce them correctly. Anyways, and that's called PFU, and obviously, again, it's derived from the name of the bacterium, PFU, PFU. And this polymerase is pretty handy because uh, it does have exonuclease activity. So, it's for, so if you want to make sure that it's correct, absolutely correct, for example, for cloning, you want to use this. And uh, it cause, it's because it has the proof rating, it won't leave any, you know, won't leave any overhangs of, of adenine at the three prime ends. So it's going to, these are blunt ended proof read uh, uh, DNA fragment. So this is uh, obviously, um, you can say it's better than tag polymerase because of that re reason. But I guess if you want you want the overhang you know, for cloning, then I guess tag will be, will be better. And also tag is a little bit faster than PFU. So PFU takes a, a longer time to, to amplify. So. I mean, they're both very good. Some people use TAC, some people use PFU. Um, I know in my lab, we always use PFU or, or PFX, which is like the Invitrogen's uh, commercial stuff. But it's really up to you, I guess, depending on your lab and, you know, your situation. But that's kind of like the general differences between TAC and uh, PFU. And the last thing I kind of want to talk about is just some general troubleshooting um, some general troubleshooting for PCR. So, kind of an overall review, I have like less than three minutes left of this video, so I'm just gonna try to hit the main point. So, you know, you have the initial denature, denaturing step, make sure you include that, which is, you know, around 95 degrees C, or maybe even higher than that, for like 30 seconds or so, right? Then you have, you know, the cycles, the one, two, and three, you know, cycles. You have, you know, more denaturing, you know, at like 90 or 95 or whatever for like a certain amount of time. Um, and then you have uh, the annealing step, which is, you know, lower, lowest than your lowest TM. So let's just say 55. And then you have the extension time, which is usually around 70 some degrees is where like the uh, polymerase has its optimal activity. So, and then of course you can keep your uh, <coughs> PCR product at four degrees forever. So, so what's uh, so what you gotta be aware about one of the most important things is your annealing temperature. You wanna make sure this is uh, um, around five degrees lower than your lowest TM, and uh, your um, also though. But the thing is, for your annealing temperature, you might also want to like, for example, increase it. If you're getting a lot of non-specific binding or priming, you can increase this to reduce that um, the non-specific priming stuff. So that's one way of uh, kind of get cleaner PCR product is to uh, increase um, annealing temperature uh, to avoid uh, non, or not to avoid, I guess to eliminate non-specific priming. Especially if you have a really large uh, um, template DNA. So that might be kind of random. And what else? Well, everything else is, I think I already covered in the first video, just kind of be careful, make sure you, you design your primers cor correctly, make sure there's no contamination, uh, because PCR contamination, you know, is really easy to do if you have a lot of me lab members, uh, you know, working on the same stuff. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty much about it. I believe I mentioned most of that stuff in the first video, so, and I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to wrap this up like in the next 10 seconds. 
So yeah, sorry if this video was a bit rushed. Um, but if you have any questions or anything on your mind, go ahead and just leave me uh, a comment in this comment in the description, or you can just uh, uh, message me as well. Okay, I guess that's it for now. Then I'm signing off.